Yeah, yeah. Hello and welcome. Rick B. Cotter, the October issue of Risk Management Monthly coming to you. Uh, I know we're extraordinarily late. I'm, I apologize. We have a lot of good reasons that we're late, uh, but we won't we won't uh, uh, grovel through those. I got Greg is on the line in Ann Arbor. Uh, Hi, Rick. Uh, Greg, uh, you're well. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm doing as well as I can. And you know what? If I'm on risk management you, monthly, I'm a happy guy. You know, you just got back from the ASAP meeting uh, yesterday, yes. which was the what was that the 44th meeting that you've been to or something like that? Some ridiculous number. Well, it's the first one in 44 years I haven't spoken. Uh, and uh, they, they were missing you too. Well, you Rick. know, the reason they, that you <laughs> haven't been speaking at this meeting is because after 44 years, you have nothing left to say. <laughs> that's it's, that's it's all exactly. been said. <laughs> you no, know, you know what? If it wasn't the truth, I'd I'd hate you for that. But it is. Yeah. Our guest this uh, issue is uh, Steve Coluciello. Steve uh, and Greg and I have known each other for 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 literally decades. Uh, Steve has been a member of the uh, emergency medicine abstracts uh, faculty and he's been with us on courses after courses after courses steve thanks so much for joining us uh you're you're that's not a random guest you're here because you have a side of you that is very very focused on risk management but before we get into that tell us a little bit about where you work and uh, what what you do and uh and then we'll get into the risk management part so <clears throat> I'm the vice chair at Carolinas Medical Center at Atrium Health in Charlotte, and we're a level one trauma center, transplant center, stroke center, a center for everything. And we train residents and take care of patients. And you see over 100,000 patients a year at your uh, department. You are the sixth largest trauma center in the United States of America. And... Uh, I have to tell you that I th there's about five doctors that I've met over my career who I think are frontline doctors who I just have a gut are, you know, exemplary physicians. And uh, they include uh, Billy Mallon. Uh, they include uh, Peter Vicellio. They include Neil Little. And they include you, Steve. Steve, you. Thank you. You are uh, every all the times that we get together. Your clinical experience really comes through as being somebody who actually sees patients, touches patients, uh, understands the, some of the challenges that uh, that emergency physicians have, and 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 are, are a frontline doctor and teacher. So I have the most respect for you. Now tell us a little bit about your risk management career. Well. Um, I've been interested in risk management when I got sued as a young doctor and wanted to learn more about the legal system and the med mal system. And um, I've been doing uh, case reviews for the last 30 years. I've reviewed about 600 med mal cases. And there are themes that resonate throughout these cases. And I wanted to talk about some of those themes tonight. Uh, you also were the um, working with one of the malpractice insurance companies and writing a was it a monthly newsletter on yes. um, on clinical topics, trying to alert the um, clients of this company how to stay out of trouble. Yep. And you submitted an outline uh, today, a, a, an expanded outline. And it, honest to God, I said to Greg. It looks like this. I wrote this outline. It is. <laughs> well, it, actually, it, it looks like I wrote this outline. <laughs> We're wondering who stole what from who, who here. Stole, well, yes, exactly. <laughs> but you know what? What it really means is after a while, you don't have to be that smart to figure out what the patient is thinking. And if you're a chief of a department, you look for things in the people who, who work for you because when they screw up, your life is miserable. Now, over the, I don't know, 15 or 12 years that we've been doing this, we have talked about um, medical entities pretty much ad nauseum in terms of like uh, 
missed missed MIs and appendicitis and ovarian torsions and all and that's all of these you know testicular things and all of these things that tend to be associated with with suits and we try to concentrate on the medicine of that but Steve the the uh, you started out with the other side of the equation what is the expectation that you're going to have of the doctors in your department or the doctors that you're training when they when they get out in terms of how they behave not only in terms of their clinical knowledge but their knowledge on how to be and act like somebody who cares so and you want to start there, there's no question yes i think that establishing a bond with your patient is good medicine in so many ways. Part of it is you learn why they're there. They come to trust you. And from a very selfish perspective, you enjoy medicine more. If you don't enjoy patients, then do something else because the headaches far outweigh the rewards in medicine. If you don't, if you can't reconnect and learn how to enjoy patient care. And so that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about. You know, the primary care doctors have years to establish a relationship. We have seconds. So how can we do that in seconds? Well, one of the first things is the social amenities. People in the ED are scared. It's unfamiliar. And if we do familiar things, it can put them at ease. And the first thing is knock on the door. And if there's no door, shake the curtain and say, I'm coming in, but knock. And when you go in, I shake the hand of everybody in the room. Now with COVID, I fist bump them. So now I go in and the old ladies love the fist bump, but I fist bump everybody in the room. And again, during COVID, I know I need to apologize for the wait because waits went from minutes to hours and sometimes it seems like days. So I'm sorry you had to wait. And if they're really hot, I let them vent. And right. one of the biggest mistakes that young doctors make is somebody says to them, I've been waiting four hours. And the young doctor goes, liar, you've only been here three hours and 45 minutes. Look at this. <laughs> so don't argue with them. Steve, I used, to, I used to see my young docs who would actually calculate off the chart uh, and they'd say, no, it's only been two hours and 50. It doesn't matter what they're expressing to you is a little bit of unhappiness. And if you, if you become contrite a little bit and say, look, we're no and we're sorry, but I'm here now. Let me see if I can make it better. That's that it. will that'll cover 95% of all sins. If you want to pick a fight with them, I actually had one guy who used to actually do the figuring of the math. I said, they're not talking about numbers. They're talking about the fact that they're lonely, depressed, unhappy, and they had to sit here in this terrible room by themselves. You know, I, um, I'm kind of of the view that um, when you knock on the door, you are basically uh, an extending a courtesy. Uh, you, uh, you could certainly go into the room without doing that, but it's kind of asking permission. It, it basically, it tends to put you in the position of the, um, of the servant. I'm here to serve you. And the other thing that I think that, that makes that occur is to apologize for the wait routinely, it doesn't matter whether there was a wait or not. Just the fact that you go in there and say, introduce yourself and say, I'm sorry if you had any wait. Absolutely. It might have been, been a 20-minute wait or, or something like that. But I, I think that that is a great way to establish um, the relationship in terms of I'm here to, to – uh, be your agent and i'm here to respect your your time and um i'm going to take care, good care of you and and steve's right you, you don't have much time to establish that so like the knock on the door the fist bump the um uh, introduction of yourself and whoever's with you you may have a nurse with you or a pa with you 
uh, or you have a student with you, and I think that we've brought, brought this up before, if you have a student with you, you have to introduce the student to the uh, people and uh, basically ask their permission to have the student get, be part of this uh, team that's going to be involved. And I think the patient respects you for that, that you've actually taken a moment to tell them there's going to be somebody else in the room. I, I, I think probably it was two or three people in my entire career where they were against it but at least it identified people for them. Yeah, Steve, you have residents and students and all kinds of people in your department. Is there any kind of a policy that basically says these folks need to be introduced and, uh, and get the permission of the patient for them to be involved in their care? Well, they sign something at the very beginning, which I'm sure they don't read, which is this is a teaching hospital, there are residents here. But this talk that I'm giving to you, I give to all of my residents at the beginning of the year. And it's described as showtime, is that medicine is a performance and we need to put on a show for them that they'll remember. And the opening act has to be a good one. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets introduced. There's nobody that's not part of the team. Um, when a nurse comes in with me, I manage up. I say, you know, you're lucky. You have the best nurse in the hospital. You got the fifth best doctor, but you got the best <laughs> nurse. So right. exactly. And I used to, uh, I used to always uh, use the phrase that medicine is show business for ugly people. And if you, <laughs> if you don't understand that you're on stage and they're watching, you've made a huge mistake. I, uh, I had one of the med students once who had every um, political button he could have on his jacket. And what I said was, why would you pick a fight with somebody for no reason? See, you don't know if they're uh, a, a Democrat or a Republican or a socialist, wear nothing except your white coat and your smile. Why would, why would you go out of your way to piss people off? And, you know, he never really thought about it that way. I said, I, and of course he immediately got into, well, I have a right. I said, in this room, in this hospital, yes, you have rights, but think about your patients a little bit. Why would you upset somebody for no reason? Yeah, I'd agree. So, so the idea is, and Greg, you've always st stressed it, and, and Steve just did it again. It's the big opening. Right. It's the right. big opening. And, and uh, mm -hmm. this talk, uh, Steve, is clearly... Um, Many people never get it, and, and they think that the job is to make the diagnosis, and um, that's just, that's that's just the least part of, of the job. Yeah. Yes. And the well, other part of this job is, is you got to learn to do this stuff, and you got to make it part of your routine so that people say, geez, that's a, do you have a private practice? Uh, it, it, that's their way of saying, I, I like you, and I'd like you to be my doctor, which is kind of like the ultimate compliment. Neil yes. Little once said it this way. He said, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And, and whatever it is that you do to initially start that communication is how they're going to think about you. And you might as well get off on the right foot mm -hmm. because half the time we don't have the exact diagnosis when they leave. And the last thing you want is somebody who's mad about something else you did. Well, you know, it's often they come in with a chip on their shoulder because the, the initial experience has been so cold and they had to basically wait and, uh, you know, the, uh, give all this information here kind of thing. And the, 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 somebody's got the, you know, as the world turns on the uh, TV and they, they don't want to watch that kind of thing, they want Oprah. So... Yes. Um, Steve, you had, as you move down your list, uh, you had you definitely had the uh, thing that everybody talks about regarding sitting down. If 
but but you have to have it something to sit on. Something right. I was in an ER recently. I looked around. There, there was nothing to sit on. Right. Well, I I we just got our satisfaction scores back, and like everybody, post COVID, during COVID, they plummeted, and common complaints is doctors didn't spend enough time with me. Yes. Doctors didn't listen. Doctors didn't talk to me. And there have been about five studies on just sitting down. They videotaped whether the doctor sat and whether they didn't, whether they put a stool in the room or whether they didn't. And patient satisfaction in communication, time spent, doctors listen, doctors care, went up 10 points minimum in each of those when the doctor or provider sat. Some so of those simple. studies, some of those studies go back years and nothing's changed. As soon as you become, as we used to point out, when you sit down, you're actually putting yourself slightly below the patient, which is the correct relationship. They're the boss guy. If you sit down, you're not sort of lording over them, you know, uh, next to the bed. So I'm a huge believer that a chair, even, first of all, I'm old. And if you get to sit down for a minute or two, that's good. But the actual amount of time doesn't matter. It's the fact that you were off your feet and, um, some people believe that when you're off your feet, you're on their case. And I like that. Well, and the time perceived in one study, the yeah. time they asked the patients, how long did the doctor spend with you? And they overestimated by a factor of three when the provider was sitting. Of course. So easy. <laughs> yeah, so easy. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of things that are a lot harder than sitting. Sitting is, <laughs> you get it you get a chance to get off, off your feet. And uh, Steve, the things that you mentioned in terms of what patients are complaining about are just kind of universal. Like the doctor didn't, you know, didn't spend enough time with me. I've seen them where they said the doctor never touched me or examined me. And in th some cases, I think that that was a hundred percent true. Right. Uh, the other thing is it doesn't matter what you examine or how long you examine it. They remember if you touched, if you looked, if you pulled out a stethoscope. I don't think it, half the time when we're listening to the heart, have we heard a soft grade uh, five over six murmur? No, but we've listened and patients believe in it. And you have to say, hmm, hmm. Mm. Yes. So, so that, down, moving down your list is this business about touching. Now, and I, and I agree with you. I'll well, tell you, they've done a million studies where they looked at patient satisfaction between physicians and different specialties and chiropractors and who wins every time. Chiropractors. It was a chiropractor. Of course. Why? And, they moved they them around. They jerked the head. They did. They touched them. Yeah. And they did stuff which has maybe no scientific basis, but we're not selling pure science. I never once had a patient ask me to draw out the structure of an amino acid. It never happened in my, in my 100,000 patient career. And, and, but Lots of people wanted to be examined, and that's fine. That's what we do. Yes. Yeah, their perception so, of the importance of the exam is disproportionately uh, important to them, I think. We, they think that, that uh, listening with the stethoscope actually means something. Um, but so I think you got to do it. And, and even if, uh, you know, I see... These people, you're, you're listening through the, the gown and all this other stuff. It's really kind of like uh, not a, a serious examination of the lungs and heart. It's kind of like a cursory. But if you do it and you touch their belly, and and uh, the, I think that that's really 
it's meeting their expectation that you will be examined. And the had, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I had a, I had one resident who said to me, of course, he ultrasounded everything in the world. And he saw my stethoscope and said, oh, that's Dr. Jewelry. That just identifies as you a doctor. This is the real machine to listen with. And I said, you know, a lot of people feel happy when they've been listened to with this old machine. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you understand its limitations, then it's okay. Yes. Steve, when you list, list the touching part, so part of that is kind of the exam part, but I also think there's a part of the touching which is a bonding part. You mentioned you shake people's hand. Uh, that's a bonding part. Sometimes when their persons are, are more, uh, maybe more elderly or obviously more frightened, a, a hand on the forearm is a comforting kind of uh, move. It's a kind of a, 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 a sympathetic kind of move or, or on the shoulder, but it's, it's, it, it, it is, it, 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 it means something to people that you've taken the time to do that and you're bonding and connecting with them. If it's a I healing see, touch. Healing it's a touch. healing touch. When I see that I've got an, an elderly patient, and now that gets younger and younger, of course, <laughs> that, that I'm going to see, I always, and this is Michigan, it's cold, I bring in a blanket from the blanket warmer because there is nothing a patient likes more than a warm blanket. It, it, that sounds like Snoopy and the cuddly dog sort of thing. But you know what? If you're laying in one of, the, on one of those gowns that you can see everything through and the air conditioning is running or whatever's going on, a warm blanket is a nice thing. Oh, it's a gesture. Uh, it's a gesture. Uh, yes. A pillow, a blanket. Yes. Uh, all all can I, comfort. Can I get you a pillow? You know, yes. otherwise you're like laying or like going, <laughs> yeah. um, let them speak. So this is interesting. Uh, everybody thinks that they let the patient speak, but they've done a bunch of studies. And the first one was in the early 1990s, late 1980s, where they videotaped uh, emergency physicians and primary care. And they wanted to know when did the provider, the physicians at those days, how many seconds did it take to interrupt the patient? And in the 1990s, it was 18 seconds. In 18 seconds, the patient said chest pain. We said, where does it radiate? Is there diaphoresis? Did you have nausea? Was it exertional? What's your cholesterol like? What are your risk factors? So they repeated this study right. in 2000s. And what did they learn? You think that we would have been smarter, and instead of 18, we would have been up to 36 seconds. It dropped we were, to seven seconds, right? It dropped to a handful of seconds. You right. could count the seconds on a hand. So that's the etiology of the three-minute rule. Now, there are some people, maybe 2 3%, that will go on and on and drone about how their aunt had something similar back in the 50s. The vast majority of patients will run out of steam and say everything they need to stay in three minutes. So if you can just stifle yourself at least for one minute, at least beat the 18 second mark, let them talk. Yeah. And then you can jump all over them. I so, also th think the phrase, is there anything else you'd like to tell me, uh, allows them to... Uh, it makes it clear that you you're you're taking in all of this stuff and you've been paying attention. It's it, it, I think it's just kind of like a bit of a nice way to end their their period of talking to you. Understand yes. that the average pay, the average medical student learns from you and I how they ought to do this, and when they watch us doing the interviews, believe me. I, I'm sure we've all broken some of those rules, and 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 I know we shouldn't, but it, it when you're busy and and you're trying to move through these things, it's very hard. The other thing is, as soon as the patient discussion starts out with 
back in 1947, uh, we get we have a tendency to want to focus that discussion right so i read a very very interesting article about talking to patients uh and it was a new england journal article in 2018 by tamur salder and he described his internship and the first case presentation he gave to his preceptor and he wanted it to be perfect. And he was a gentleman who was walking his dog and fell. And as an intern, he knew everything about this patient. He found out that the patient's grandmother had lupus. And he knew the review of systems, a physical exam, and gave a 15-minute presentation and knew that his preceptor could not trip him up on anything because he had spent the day preparing this case and his preceptor asked him one question he said you say that he was walking his dog when he fell yes what was the name of the dog and the title of the article is the name of the dog and he writes it led to a transformation i did not fully appreciate at the time there was an actual person behind behind that hospital issued gown and this comes back to something we need to think of every day, every encounter. We treat the person, not the disease. So it, it gets very easy to say the, uh, the the diabetic in room three, and that kind of helps in re reinforce something that should not be reinforced. Um, but it but it's you see it all the time, and so it's like monkey see monkey do and these young doctors basically are watching the awesome. senior doctors in terms of how they behave and if uh, they behave in the way we're we're, uh, we're asking them to behave we also think it's, it's really important in terms of exactly as you said steve you will enjoy what you're doing better when you appreciate these people who have family friends histories uh, of of things that they've accomplished and and hopes and dreams kind of thing rather than it's it's a broken hip in room room four yep. um, here in the here in the mid here in the midwest we see lots of people from farms and that so and they'll have an argo seed hat on that and if you just ask them one question about what are you planting this year or this that or another thing all of a sudden they feel more comfortable talking to you. I learned a little bit about no-till technique in preparing the ground uh, because of one of my injured patients off his tractor. But you know what? I use that with other people who had farm uh, insignias on them. They all wanted to talk about, and they couldn't believe a doctor actually knew about no-till farming. And, and something like that can sometimes pave the way. Exactly. Estimated weights. Now, when you go to Disney World, the Disney World's the master of the weight. They are and if the you, master. <laughs> and if you see a sign that says 15-minute wait to Space Mountain, is it ever 20 minutes? Never. It is never more than the estimated wait time. And it's usually 30% less because they know you start getting anxious. So under promise and over deliver. Sure. And this is the biggest thing with corporations and administration with us. They over promise and under deliver. And that pisses the shit out of us. Yeah. We hate it yes. because we feel we've been lied to. Yeah, but so, that's not true of this business. That's true of everybody who's actually in business. And, you know, we, I know some of the young docs don't want to hear the term business. But when people come in and spend their money, they'd like to have expectations that are met. What a strange world. They'd actually expect to get something. I, I always overestimate how long I think it will be so that they're always pleased. You're the hero. If you're 
I multiply times three. So if I say the CAT scan is going to be two hours and it's one hour, I'm the hero. But if it's four hours, I'm the goat. Right. So always multiply times three. And then this is what one thing I learned from Greg very early on. Can I get you anything for pain? Now, that does not mean how about 50 of IV Dilaudid. It may be a pillow. It may be an ice pack. It may be a splint. It may be a Tylenol. It may be aromatherapy in some EDs, music therapy, local anesthetic. But can I get you anything for pain? That's a, also, that, that's kind of equivalent uh, to uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry for the weight. It's like they yes. may, have, because it's, there's, there's these studies that show that a lot of older people who are, are coming complaining of some kind of uh, issue, they also have chronic pain. They have pain in their back, their neck, their hip. They can't lie flat, those kinds of things. And uh, just the fact that you offered is a fact that you, uh, you are a humane, warm doctor who doesn't want you know, your patient to suffer. It's really a symbol. It's, it's, you're right. You're not going to be giving kind of, uh, this is not necessarily uh, going to be acted upon, but just the fact that you asked, you get credit for asking. Right. And then something I just thought of that you reminded me of, Rick, is before you leave, recap. Now, if I've got the story right, you had sudden onset chest pain that went to your back and it felt like something was tore up inside of you. And make sure you got the story right. I think also when you're uh, about to leave, you also are going to sum up, okay, here's, a, here's the game plan. The nurse is going to come in and she's going to start an IV. It's not going to hurt very much at all. We use these very small needles now. And we're going to get a few uh, blood tests and uh, we're going to send you over to the CAT scan department where we're going to scan your entire body uh, in, in an attempt to find out what the hell's wrong with you so that you basically give them the game plan. Here's what we're going to do. Right. Uh, and you say the famous words from the best movie ever. I'll be back. I'll be back. Right. Because <laughs> they about? don't necessarily believe you're going to be back. No, that, but I think that that's true. I think personally yeah. that um, no matter really what a person is there for, what, what a person's there for, sticking your head in every half hour just to say, how are you feeling? That, you know, is, 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 there, is your stomach still upset or we're still waiting for your doctor to call back, those kinds of things. Just a quick head in the room kind of thing. And certainly for somebody who's, who's clearly sick, then, then it may be more frequent than that. But I think, you know, you lay in bed, you're looking at the ceiling for half an hour. It'd be nice if the, somebody, the doctor stuck his head in, the, head in just to say, ask, advise what's going on, that kind of thing. Just, just a quickie. You know, or, we use we use phrases and things which the patients don't understand. I did once in my career have somebody, we say, is this terrible chest pain? Is this like an elephant sitting on your chest? Well, I did have a professor of mechanical engineering from the university who had been a mahout in India as a child, and he raised a baby elephant which rolled on him and essentially sat on his chest. I had to ask the question, is this pain like the elephant sitting on your chest? And, and, and he says, oh no, elephant much worse. And so I said, listen, you're the only guy I've ever had who actually had an elephant sit on his chest. I, I actually did have someone who had an elephant sit on his chest, but he wasn't talking. <laughs> so, so, Rick, that pretty much finished. We're going to talk about discharges and going back and wrapping things up a little later. But I wanted to switch gears a little bit now and talk about thinking about thinking. So they say that everything you learn in medical school about 50% of it will be proven wrong in the first five years after you leave. I mean, that's the pace of 
medical, maybe not anatomy, but uh, the drugs and our understanding of disease and therapy, much of it is wrong and much of it will be supplanted well before you retire. But there's certain things about thinking, which are biases, which are errors in thinking, we need to be aware of and consider whenever we have a repeat visit, whenever we have a failure, whenever we have an M&M come up, why did this happen? Was it lack of knowledge or was it something else? So the first thing that emergency physicians do, and I say this to all my off-service residents who give me this long differential diagnosis and Chuchu Gamuchi disease is right. first on the list. <laughs> I say, let's, let's keep this simple. I'm a, I'm a simple country doc. When you tell me a differential diagnosis, I want worst first. So I don't want to know what's most likely. I want to know what's worse. You look like you're about to say something, Greg. No, it, it, I would always tell the residents, what's going to kill them? Because exactly. for several reasons, it's worse for the patient and for you as the guy who's got to give testimony in court on this deal, they'd like to know that you thought about the worst thing that could happen to this guy. Exactly. Now, you don't have to test for everything. 99% can be eliminated by history and physical. So even though somebody may have a high fever and their eyes are red, that doesn't mean they have Ebola. If right. they haven't been to the Congo, they probably don't have Ebola. So, but at least think with chest pain, with headache, with back pain, what's the worst per thing this person can have? And then in your mind, rule it out almost always by history and physical, but sometimes by lab imaging, et cetera. And then everybody needs to be aware of their biases. And the study of bias, go on Google and do images and bias and you'll see pictures and you'll see a picture of an anchor. And that's the anchoring bias, which is the most dangerous thing in medicine, which is a diagnosis. Right. So somebody comes in and they have a diagnosis, then you stop thinking. And when you practice medicine, you see anchoring all the time, even from the triage nurses. So when a nurse sends an abdominal pain or a vomiting patient to fast track, you treat them differently than if you were in the acute care area because they're a triage code four and you're not thinking of triage code one diagnoses. We all get into this it, it's simply because we're changing shift and somebody says, well, you know, make sure you check on the abdominal pain. In fact, you've forgotten to ask because you didn't ask the questions because you didn't take the history. You forget that he also fell off the back of a truck and has a broken leg, has this, has that. Well, I, I've been there and it and what you realize, you look stupid even to yourself that you accepted the terms given to you. Yeah, just kind of kind of look at this guy in there if you get a chance. That's not the same as having examined a patient. And what I used to do is tell the next guy on, I've sent some labs, I've done this, but I have not worked them up. Because if you haven't really gone through the history and done it right, you don't know the patient. Well, we're going to cover that in, in more depth at the at the end. Um, this these biases, there. You know, I it, the, the I've seen where there's 10, 15, Every everybody incorporation bias, like uh, that's not there, Steve. Have you heard of incorporation bias, or is that like a? a uh, is that well, there's, that might be confirmation bias is that we hear what we want to hear. Yes. So if we think that they have a gastroenteritis, oh, do you have diarrhea? Yes, I have diarrhea. Well, we don't 
ask, do they have vomiting? Or if they don't have vomiting, we just ignore the fact that they're not vomiting, concentrate on the diarrhea and call it gastroenteritis. So then there's also authority bias. So we have somebody say, well, this patient has this diagnosis and because they're the authority, again, we stop thinking. And we see that all the time in a teaching institute. All of us are fallible. Yes, because they were worked up by the chief of gastroenterology who says it's this, you know what? They can be wrong like all the rest of us. And sometimes the patient has the right to your independent thoughts on the situation. Not that you would trash or say anything bad about anyone else, but you know what? Disease changes and we sometimes don't get it right. And that's in all of us. There was a study I remember where it was in primary care where uh, when when a doctor was on vacation, another doctor would come in and cover this doctor for a week or however long the vacation was. So he would see these patients and they all came in with a diagnosis. Uh, This one is hypothyroid. This one's got this, that one's got that. And uh, what they found is that having a new set of eyes a new doctor, a new st- a, a, and not assuming that the diagnosis is correct, they found out the, the new doctor made a bunch of diagnoses that uh, in these patients that were in fact correct. That the other doctor just said, "Well, it's a hypothyroid, hypothyroid, hypothyroid," and in fact, the, the fresh set of eyes really said that that's really uh, I'm thinking about something different kind of thing, and it turned out to be right. But these biases are absolutely. Um, Troublemaking. I, I saw a case recently where uh, a younger person came in with uh, some chest pain, and uh, they they pretty much ruled out a myocardial infarction. They had gotten a bunch of troponin serially and all that, and EKGs were uh, unremarkable. Yet the person still had this pain, and then they did uh, a D dimer, and you know that was that was negative. So they thought maybe it was uh, maybe that was a PE kind of thing, and th- they just kind of said, "Well, we can't send this person home because they're having this persisting pain," and uh, they sa- said, "Let let's just admit them," and you know, and they sent them to the floor, and as they got to the floor, the patient arrested uh, with his uh, dissection. And getting back to what you said, Steve, you got to think of the worst first. Well, in the chest, the worst first are uh, myocardial infarction, PE, and dissection. And certainly, dissection is the least frequent uh, that you're going to see. So you may not think of that routinely at all, but it is part of the worst first things. And uh, in this case, it was unfortunately not considered. It was missed. And the patient was in the ER for five or six hours. And... uh, Maybe there could have been an intervention. Who, you know, Who we don't, we don't know yeah. that. But but the worst first thing needs to basically make sure that you are including like the big three for the chest. Exactly. We, we all get into this idea that we're somehow less of of the great doc if we say, you know, I don't know. I may have to bring them in and watch them, and. When I look back over my career, the number of times I did that, about half the time, it was the right thing to do. Did a well, few Greg, people yeah. <laughs> did a few people get admitted that maybe shouldn't have? And do they give, you know, and somebody up on the medicine floor always gives you shit. Like, like see, the air, the oxygen concentration up on those floors is so high and they can always, after four days, figure it out. Um, they got to give us a break sometimes. Well, you know, and say, look, admit this one. Having observation units now basically kind of allows you to get away from this. I got to decide in or out. Now there's a lateral that you can do yes. to help you out. Right. And what Greg was hinting at is the issue of ego, which is the next thing I wanted to bring up in medicine. And uh, I would recommend people do a Google image search on the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it is a graph of how confident you are on the x-axis and why is how competent 
you are. So confidence versus competence. And when you start out in medicine, you have a lot of confidence misplaced and you know nothing and you're on Mount Stupid. <laughs> and then you fall from Mount Stupid because you start making mistakes and people start suffering and you realize you don't really know much at all. And that's the valley of despair. And over time and with experience, you become more enlightened, more confident and more competent until you reach a plateau. But I wanted to talk about an older doctor. We know about younger doctors in Mount Stupid. There's the hill of hubris that yeah. happens with older doctors. And we think we're, we've been doing this for 30 years. We're at the top of our game. And in an instant, we think we see the guy with alcohol intoxication, he's drunk. We see the guy with the uh, diabetes. So oh, he has too high or too low. And in the subdural, we miss it in the alcoholic because we're so sure this is another time he's drunk again and the patient suffers. Yeah, so the great danger is let him sleep it off right. <laughs> and we'll look at him in four or six hours. Well, you don't have to look at him in four or six hours because he's arrested by then. Right. The, the, the worrisome thing is the quiet drunk, not the noisy drunk. Yes, yes. And then the, the final coup de grace is you come in the next day and they say, remember that patient? <laughs> the words of the ER doc never wants to hear. Never wants to hear, right. Remember that patient. Yeah, well, um, I do think that some time for contemplation about uh, our sources of bias. Uh, some people have will acknowledge some of their biases, like... I must admit, I flunked Gypsy. Um, I had a hard time seeing Gypsies. Um, they kind of pushed my buttons, and um, it was like, well, since I was the only doctor in the department, it was like, well, you got to go see the Gypsies. And um, I basically, in my case, I knew I haven't had an issue, but but I think there are other times when people have issues that they're that they are kind of oblivious to so i said i think steve you're right that this is some contemplation of your of you as a clinician as a diagnostician um the uh, uh, the areas where you can where it's known that physicians make mistakes um there the, if if you're aware of these kinds of things like anchoring bias and such then you are more likely, I think, to avoid them and the traps associated with them. I, one of the things I like to teach the residents was make that, sit down and make a list of those things and those personality things that really make you mad. Now, whenever any one of those patients is there, excuse yourself and go out and think for two minutes Am I giving this patient the kind of care they deserve? I have at least twice in my career asked another doctor to see a patient because they'd made me so, because they brought up so many feelings I didn't like. Now, am I proud of myself for that? No, but I'm glad they got to see another doctor uh, because we're just, we're just folks. And sometimes we do things that aren't necessarily good. Yeah, know, know where your buttons are. Know Very where the, important. Because everybody knows how to push your buttons. You know, the drug-seeking patient, the, the nurse who wants you to pay attention. You know, there's always a nurse who actually is an MD, PhD on the side. Uh, and if you don't think they can't push your button occasionally, you, you, you don't understand your own personality structure. So changing gears once again, I want to talk about something that is so important and so underappreciated in the medical record, and that are vital signs. And, <laughs> you know, 
why are they called vital signs? Well, for I a think reason. Yes. <laughs> they, you know, from uh, history, they are vital, meaning signs of life. But for malpractice, they are vital, and we better pay attention to them. And we better attention, pay attention to which direction they're going. So we all know blood pressure, heart rate, pulse oximetry, respiratory rate, temperature, pain, if you want to call that a vital sign. But I want you to think, or the listeners, to think about some other vital signs that are simple but crucial. And that one of them is the shock index. So if you take everybody's heart rate divided by their systolic blood pressure, that's a shock index. And it's usually point below 0.7, almost always below 0.8. Um, when you get above 0.9, and certainly when you get to one, where your heart rate is, uh, where your uh, systolic blood pressure is the equal to your heart rate, once you have a shock index of 1.3, and you may not think that the heart rate is that fast or the blood pressure is that low, but if you divide the heart rate by the blood pressure and you're at 1.3, the risk of mortality is six times that of somebody with a normal shock index. Hypotension. If somebody has been hypotensive in the field, or hypotensive in the ED at any time. And I know maybe the medics got a spurious blood pressure, or maybe it was just low for a little while. Hypotension in the ED is a marker three times mortality. So shock index number one, hypotension number two, and number three, what are the discharge vital signs? Exactly. I can't tell you how many times a malpractice case has been lost because of inattention to the discharge vital signs. Greg? I can't tell you the number of times I've been to court and had to talk about that last, well, isn't that last number a little low, Dr. Henry? Isn't it this or that? He said, could you have sat them for another half hour and repeated it? Well, the answer to that is you always can. But the bottom line is we do need to pay attention to those numbers. If you don't like the number, doctors are allowed to take their own vital signs. It doesn't have to be somebody else. And have I ever done that? Yes. Or I've talked to the patient about the fact that they've had problems for years with, with, with their numbers and that sort of thing. But you know what? I want to feel comfortable with it before I let them out the door because it sits there as an objective measure of something. We don't have that many objective measures on which to make decision. A blood pressure of uh, 80 over 40, there's something wrong. <laughs> and, and we probably ought to ask a couple more questions. And, and, and it's cheap. Um, you can do it with with equipment which was around 100 years ago or 80 years ago. None of this is high tech. And we, we need to pay attention to low, low tech, but obviously right in our face kinds of numbers. And which way are they going? If yes. somebody, you're supposed to get better after an ED visit. If you're being discharged after an ED visit and your numbers are worse, hold up. Hold What's on. going on here? Yeah. Yeah, one of the other things is is that um, these numbers are are not subjective. At, uh, at 100.4 is a fever, and uh, basically, if you don't recognize that as a fever, and you, you get into uh, medical legal trouble, it w you don't need a lot of expert testimony to say yes, that that's the definition of a fever, or up a heart rate over a hundred is 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 a tachycardia. You know, th these there there are these numbers which are black and white. This is an abnormal number. Can you explain that number? Yes, I can. Uh, is it is it a, a bad problem that has caused that number? No, it isn't. And I feel comfortable that that patient can go home, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to know the numbers, or or the or the numbers may come back and bite you because. Uh, set of vital signs was taken you weren't aware of them at the uh, prior to discharge of the patient the and best line i ever heard in court was 
somebody said, one of the nurses said, well, I took those other vital signs. I wrote them on the sheet. And the, and the attorney giving her the problem said, oh, you thought they needed those numbers more in central laundry than they did in the department? And it, w- it was just the way he said that. And you could see the look on the jury's face that you understand People understand we've been doing this for a long time and vital signs are just a part of showing up at the doctor. You know, when we, when uh, you review a chart for a mal- potential malpractice case, one of the first things you hone into are the vital signs um, and which way they're going, where they taken with enough frequency was there intermittent uh, observations by the nurses, the doctors, et cetera, if the signs are um, suspicious in terms of, of what the numbers are? So I think that, yes, uh, you see these cases where they have a minute by minute uh, log of what transpired in the emergency department. And these lawyers, you know, get this to, is, is as exacting as possible. And you'll find out the patient was there for X hours and never had a repeat of vital signs. And um, now look what happened kind of thing. So and vital a, signs, I think, are really, really, really important. Right. And there's a corollary to this because the nurses have certain things they need to do to make that chart complete. Yes. And when you discharge a patient, that may not be the final set of vital signs. So time and time and time and time again, you're done with the patient, things look all right, you would put up discharge and you never look at that chart again. But the nurse takes another set of vital signs that are scary, that are a warning, and you don't know about it. Yeah, the significance so. is not appreciated necessarily by that last set. And uh, yes, you get blindsided there. And you need a policy that the nurses report abnormal vital signs. It's got to be police. This is, you don't want to have a whole lot of, you don't want to have a million rules in the ED. You want to have a few rules that people can follow. And that is if they have an abnormal vital sign, the nurse tells the doctor. Right. Steve, we have about uh, 20 minutes left and you have a a goodly. We're just getting started, Rick. (laughs) Yeah, we'll have to have you part two, part two. Um, let's keep going and see how this goes, because I have no problem uh, ex- expanding this until uh, November. Uh, I think that, frankly, this is where it's at. We've, we've really talked a lot about the... the we can come act. together again to, to, <laughs> to expand this if we want. There's, there's no rule that says we can't do another, um, another issue. Yeah, Steve, you wanted to talk about bounce backs. Right. And this uh, is I'd like to have your listeners buy the book series Bounce Backs by Michael Weinstock, Kevin Clower, with commentary by Greg Henry, because there is so much to learn by bounce backs. And many, many doctors get pissed off when a patient returns. They go, why the hell is he, why the hell is she (laughs) back here again? And there's about three categories, and there's all studies on on this, but think of it as thirds. So a third is the patients misunderstood their discharge instructions. They thought they were supposed to go to the emergency room in two days when they're supposed to go to the orthopedic clinic, or they were supposed to see their doctor, but they came back to us instead. That's okay. That's a miscommunication. Another third is it's a natural progression of the disease. So if they have COVID, uh, about 20% of them are going to get worse, maybe 30%, and they're going to come back. And that's the time where we can take another look and see if they need admission, hospital at home, natural progression of disease. But there's that last third that we really have to think about. And that is the first doctor took a swing and a miss. They missed the, not have gastroenteritis at all, but had appendicitis. The patient did not have costochondritis. They had dissection. 
you know, we, we so, always had patients would, would come in and you'd see a doctor making a face like so-and-so's back again. My view of that is, thank God they came back to us because if they'd gone home and died or they'd gone to the hospital down the street, uh, the, though the person to see them next might be as kind to you. <laughs> about what we did the first time. God love them if they come back to me because yeah. I can always talk them into, in, into the right way of thinking about this and uh, don't let them go someplace else. Invite them back. Yeah, the patient's coming back and saying, I'm giving you another opportunity to get it right. Right, so, that's what they're saying, Rick. So I, and, and we've seen this time and time again in MedMal, where they see five different doctors, they keep being sent home. Right. And you're reading this chart and going, oh my God, stop, stop. Right. It's, you know, like screaming, don't go down to the basement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but they, it's, it's written in stone, it's happened. Yeah. So do a good job on the first visit, do a better job on the third visit, on the second visit, do a better job on the second visit and admit them on the third visit. Exactly. I, I mean, if, if you, you three strikes and you're out, just I haven't figured it out or at least do this, which I, I always found useful. If you're working with another doc, say, look, I saw them the last time and see the mistake is to say, well, I know them. No. You saw them the last time. They're back. Another doc, no smarter than you, but may have a different view, hear the story differently, and may want to run it a different way. The, the other thing is, I, I know there's always this tendency to want to get repeat visitors, you know, in and out. That is, that is something I have to I had to fight in myself during my practice. Now I, I'm not seeing patients anymore. I'm done with that era of my uh, practice. But I remember a few people that I wake up at night with a sweat, <laughs> thinking, you know, I shouldn't have done that, and uh, don't don't have those in, in your memory. Right. I mean, I admit the pizza guy, if he keeps delivering pizzas to the ED, on the third visit, he gets admitted. He gets admitted, exactly. And, and, no. and we don't, and we shouldn't feel bad about that. You know, we tend to feel guilty. Oh, I'm putting this workload on them upstairs. Or I'm doing that. Screw that. We're processing humans the best we can. Is it going to be perfect? Thank God it isn't. <laughs> because if we only admitted, you know, if, if we never sent anybody out, we've got, we've got to do that. But there's going to be a few we can't let go with the current story, current findings. And we, we got to stop feeling guilty about that. We have to think what was missed. What, what was, was missed? missed? Yep, exactly. So... To switch gears again, communication. I would say that if you think about it, communication is one of the major causes of litigation. Communication between the doctor and the patient, doctor and the nurse, between consultants. But there's one episode of high-risk communication or multiple episodes that happen three times a day in every ED, sometimes twice a day. Yep. And that's the handoff. Change your handoffs, shift. handoffs are responsible for about a third of emergency medicine litigation. And I'll never forget when I was a young doctor long ago, <laughs> when I was turning over to this one partner of mine, he would come in and I, the first time I ever did it, I was prepared to give him all my, I even knew the name of the dog. I was prepared to give him a full rundown in each patient. And he said, go home. These are my patients now. And I don't want to sound mean, but I don't care what you think. Now, maybe he just said that to me <laughs> and he listened to all my other partners. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he took ownership. 
He owned that patient. And when it comes to court, the discharging doc, even if the first doc screwed everything up, it's the discharging doc who's holding the, the boat. bag. Yeah, He's holding the right. bag. Right, exactly. So I remember happened to me or happened, I, uh, one of my partners said, just check the x-ray. Well, <laughs> it was a syncope patient who had fallen and their sodium was 105, but all the new doc did was check the x-ray and it wasn't broken. So you can do, and a lot of people talk about SBAR, which is situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. And that's all the rage, especially in the military. But my recommendation is take ownership. And when you see the patient, go in, talk to them, and see them with a set of fresh eyes. And there's nothing as good as when, when I would change shift, I'd love to go in with the doc I'm relieving because you know what? They do deserve rest. They need to go home. They need to get out of there. But I'd go in with them and we'd have just a couple of words about what we're going to do from this point on. And if he didn't feel comfortable with it, we'd rethink it a little bit. But I think that the face-to-face -face handoff where you get introduced, I always thought that you know, if I'm going to be a, a new face coming on, introduce me, tell them who I am. So they know who's going to be in charge of their care. If they have their mother in the room, introduce me so that they have some sense of continuity of the Pass care. the baton. Pass, Pass the baton. Yeah. The yes. passing of the baton should be done in the patient's room. And, you know, I, I really wonder how successful we've been in, get, in getting doctors to change their behavior, because I don't think that's standard behavior at all. I think it, it's um, generally reporting it in the, at the station. And um, But it's hard for me to conceive, but it happens that one doctor leaves and uh, the new doctor walks into the patient room and the, your other, and they, they say, your other doctor's off duty. I'm taking over your care. And, I, and it's like, he's off duty there's no closure there's no it's just it's just it's just it's just impolite number one no it it's worse than impolite what it really is is frightening the patient now has somebody who's going to walk in and say yeah you can go home and the patient says who are you so oh, no i'm now the guy in charge they don't like that and yeah, I, I think they, this they've is a never liked it. To introduce this doctor. He, this is one of our best doctors. He's going to be taking over your care. He knows that we're waiting for your CAT scan results and the call in from your family doctor. So yes. that, so that basically he, the, the, they have told each other what the expectation is. And the fact is, when uh, Steve, I think you said a, a term like you have to assume the care or the responsibility for the patient. Uh, you, you get it, whether you assume it or not, it's yours. Right. It's yours. It's, it's so, so you might as well just embrace the fact that if you're going to discharge this patient and your name's going to be on that discharge instruction someplace, you own that patient. And, and by the way, if I'm going to turn them over to their family doc or whatever it is, I don't care what you personally think about that doctor. I never disparage their doctor in front of their patient. They have a relationship. I'm going to do everything I can to support that doc. And I would hope he would do the same thing for me. Now, whether he does or doesn't, you know, nothing is, is served by having a, a personal conflict over, over the body of a patient. Nothing. And, and that's why I don't even like to see doctors come in and the two of you are talking over in front of the patient. I'd rather go into a, another room if there's going to be a disagreement and do it that way. Hey, hey Steve, um, go through that S-bar thing. Uh, I, I don't really necessarily 
understand uh, this the progression of these things when what situation would you use this in so for handoff we we train our residents to do a one liner so situation is 85 year old female with a history of lupus and dialysis so that's the situation so you start out by age gender and a brief uh, pertinent past medical history who fell down her stairs so that's the background but doesn't know why so now we know that she had a syncopal event we have a situation we have a fall but it is unknown of what etiology who has had a CT scan of her head and neck, basic metabolic package, uh, basic labs, a normal ECG. That's my assessment. And you may not have everything back at that time. And I recommend that we make sure that her troponin is normal, a second EKG is normal, and that we walk her before we'd ever consider discharging her. So here's the situation, background information. Here's my assessment and here's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, and it can be two sentences. It doesn't always have to be one sentence. Right. But also I like to say, I'm worried about this patient or I'm not worried or I don't know enough if I should be worried or not. I, I really don't know. I am withholding judgment, but I do personally like to say, I'm worried about this person or looking at her and looking at the whole picture doesn't seem to be anything too worrisome, but no matter how I get that, certain high risk, and we're going to go over the high risk patient later in, in this talk or another talk, I always take extra care when I come on in the morning after a night shift that is not a nocturnist. So if there's a nocturnist who's used to working nights, I have a little less agita taking <laughs> turnover in the morning by somebody who's just beat to hell, exhausted, and I know their last hour I'm not, I'm not trusting anything they saw or did. Right. So that's a high risk situation oh, that's coming on at point. night. I've never heard that before in terms of the doctor who's coming on, who was who on before you and how it may view your uh, assessment of the patients. Uh, and you need to decrease handoffs. So one of the ways is a waterfall shift. And we've talked about this at uh, the abstracts course is that somebody works seven hours seeing patients and the next doc comes in on hour seven and the old doc finishes up and does not see any new patients. They have waterfall shifts, one waterfall into the next. Make sure your nurses, your attendings, your PAs don't all do seven to three, three to 11, and 11 to seven. Make sure the nurses shifts, the doctor shifts, the APP shifts, the resident shifts are not all at the same time. So you have continuity of care. You know, it uh, seems so obvious <laughs> that that's well, the way we ought to work. That that why would you have somebody changing ownership of patients, that sort of thing, when we can do it better? And, and I think now that the number of emergency docs in the country has exploded, and it really has, I just got back from the national meeting, a lot of talk about this, but we can get enough people to, to staff some of those tough change uh, tough hours and get it done right. Although, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that it adds uh, more cost to do that. And a group has to have the, the intelligence to understand that that's a good thing to do. And yes, it may cost an, an hour early, an hour's more, more uh, payment. However, you, with that, you leave when the shift is over, you're not charting uh, indefinitely thereafter. Uh, you, you, uh, 
the pass-ons are safe with a, a waterfall shift. And I yeah. ask routinely at the courses now, we started talking about waterfall shifts maybe, you know, two or three years ago. I routinely ask, how many of you have do waterfall shifts? Virtually nobody ra raises their hand. Um, they don't. They don't do it. You just stay. I, you just stay and finish your patients, and then keep on doing your charts, etc. And you get out of there at ten hours instead of eight when you were supposed to. Right. And you, don't, you don't get paid I, for those other two hours either. Yes, I. I think we should uh, thank Dr. Colucciello for a most invigorated and interesting discussion and bring him back for us for the second half of this we've got way too much information to try and rush it in the last couple minutes Steve, you got the time to give us uh, another uh, uh episode uh, next month i do i'd be it would be my pleasure thanks Steve. my uh, pleasure greg do you want to say anything about anything resembling a wine <laughs> are you into I, wines at all anymore i i am still into wines uh, and, uh, but, but, uh, I'm going to pass, uh, this month. I do, however, I do, however, have, have, uh, because of my downsizing and changing houses and getting things, uh, really do understand more and more about the fact that certain wines do reach their time and you should not be keeping them. Uh, are you talking about us, shape. Greg? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, we are fine wines, Greg. Yes, I, is, this, I, is this a metaphor? This is a metaphor, but what can I, what can I say? Anyway, uh, Steve, it's good to see you again. Uh, I look forward to our next meeting. Me too. Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. Steve. Appreciate it very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, Rick. Ricky. Dave. Anybody? Hello. All right. All right. You there, Doctor B? Yeah. All right.